You guys see my screen? Yes, yes. everybody. Yes. So yeah. So so first of all, um, you know, thank you. you know, Paul referred to the eagerness earlier. I feel like you guys are all really jumping on this quite fast. Uh, we have more than 20 people that signed up for the Open Saw Lab already. Um, so so that's that's excellent. So as Paul mentioned, the uh, the training will use a, a cloud-based platform that we call the Open Star Lab to facilitate all the lab exercises. The reason for doing that is is for this training is because the uh, the lab is fully pre-installed, um, and we know that all the exercises work on this lab, um, and so it makes it easy for us to focus basically on the on the essential content, sort of more the the theory behind the different processing steps. Uh, without having to sort of work with all of you on debugging different uh, setup issues. Um, in the in long term, uh, there's options to either continue using the Open SAR Lab, um, but also in the training, we'll talk about how you can set up all of these tools in a local machine. So you have a variety of options going going forward. But for the sake of this training, to make sure we uh, we make efficient use of the time uh, using this preset environment uh, is is useful. So this is just to give you a little bit of information of what this Open SAR Lab is. It is a fully uh, pre-installed um, environment uh, that really is designed for for algorithm development. Um, so it, it comes pre-installed with a, a range of Python tools. Most of the work you can do on the Open SAR Lab is based on based on Python programming, uh, but it also has um, um, remote sensing tools installed, such as um, MintPy for for inside time series analysis. Uh, it has Giant for inside time series analysis. It has ICE uh, installed. It also has uh, Snap uh, online and a few additional tools that you may um, maybe maybe find useful. It also has um, the ASF API installed, so you can uh, on the Open SAR Lab mine through the through an API interface uh, the ASF uh, SAR data holdings. There's also uh, ways that we'll, you will, we will show you how you can access all of the, the data sets uh, within the uh, JPL ARIA uh, uh, system, which, which provides level two um, interferograms uh, for many areas of the world. So there's a lot of capabilities that you have within this uh, um, environment. Um, you can, most of the, the way, mostly you will use the Open SAR Lab through a Jupyter Notebook um, setup. Um, and I'll show you a notebook here in a little bit. And if you haven't seen any, you can experiment with the ones that you already find on the Open SAR Lab. Uh, open, Jupyter Notebooks, in the end, are a sort of data recipe, sort of a visual way of, 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 of demonstrating your code. Um, so you can, in Jupyter Notebooks, you can combine uh, instructions with executable code, uh, and we'll use that to both help you understand certain workflows, but also be able to exercise these works, workflows live using these notebooks. Um, you need, uh, all you need to access the Open SAR Lab is an internet enabled device with a web browser. So make sure that you have web access, um, otherwise you can attend the remote training anyway, so I take that back. Um, you all will have access to the internet. Uh, so lastly, it sits in the, in the Amazon Web Services Cloud. The idea behind this is to make sure it sits right next to the ASF SAR data archive. Nowadays, these SAR data sets are often voluminous, and you, know, you spend a lot of time downloading data sets and working with them locally. Um, so by having it sitting right next to the archive, it makes it a little more performance, but it also reduces on sort of the NASA side some costs because it avoids data egress, which is something that NASA pays for for every file that is being egressed out of the, out of the cloud. Uh, let's see, why does this not go forward? So just uh, ge generally the way the Open SAR Lab works is it connects the user who is here on the bottom of, of, the, um, of the slide. Um, so you sit down here, it co connects you with an, uh, uh, to a machine that is fully installed uh, we use sort of uh, um, AWS uh, AMIs for for pre-installing pre all these machines that you get. Everybody gets a, a storage bucket attached to their to their system, 
and I think everybody gets something like 16 gigs of, of, of RAM to, to do all of the work that they need to do. The uh, environment, as I said, comes pre-installed with all the Python tools, with a bench, bunch of SAR tools. There's also some deep learning stuff on it. So if in the future you want to play with the things like TensorFlow and Keras to do deep learning on SAR data, you can experiment with, with that too. And then, as I already mentioned, on the back end, it connects to all of the SAR data archives like uh, Griffin and ARIA uh, and, and, and ASF Vertex. But it also connects to public uh, uh, Jupyter Notebook uh, re repositories on GitHub. So all of the, re the notebooks that you will be playing with, they also they actually all exposed on GitHub, and we'll pull them uh, directly from from GitHub in the in the beginning of the labs. So if you haven't, uh, and Paul, are you? Can we send the slide deck, or have we sent this already out to everybody? I did just bef just before oh, this class. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, so in, on this slide four, there's a link uh, on the slide deck to the OpenSAR lab. So, you know, please go to that link. You'll encounter a login screen. Click on that thing that says sign in with AWS Cognito. It will, if you're a first time user, it will ask you to create uh, um, a login. So you click on that sign up button. It will ask you very simple things like what's your username, what's your email address. It's, it's very straightforward. Um, so sign up, and we will then uh, approve you uh, within sort of, I would say, about 60 minutes of your, of your sign up. And once you're approved, um, you can then, uh, you know, enter and, and, and utilize the, uh, the environment. Uh, just one note, when you sign up, so when you filled in the sign up form here on the, on the right-hand side, we're using two-factor authentication. So please watch out for an email. You will receive an email at the email address you provide, and you will have to do two-factor authentication. So we'll ask you to, to verify your email, as, as is true for many, many uh, registrations nowadays, that there's two-factor authentication. So look for an email um, once, you, once you sign up. So Franz, once, uh, if they do this on the weekend, are you still gonna give like one hour turnaround or? Uh, I, you know, I, I, I won't guarantee one hour over the weekend, but I know Bill is going to watch uh, incoming uh, signups also during the weekend. So we'll okay. try to be as fast as we can. We approve you manually. This is mostly to avoid, you know, some some bots to create like a thousand instances. Uh, um, so so the the approval step is manually, but but we'll try to stay on top of it also on the weekend. Yeah, and we made it sound in the dear participant letter like there's a true urgency to being all set up by August 3rd. That was mostly so that nobody waits till August 7th to do all of this work. So if you're not quite set up by the first thing on August 3rd, it's not going to be the end of the world. So uh, we have a whole week to, you have a whole week to work on this stuff. So go ahead. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll track signups, and if we see that a large portion hasn't signed up yet, we'll, we'll chase you down. Yeah. We'll take you down. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Uh, so once you are on it, um, <clears throat> this slide deck will show you a little bit how to use the system. So your landing page will be a sort of a Jupyter Hub uh, environment that looks a little bit either like your Windows Explorer or your Mac Finder, whatever, whatever system you're using. So it's, there's a navigation, uh, sort of you can navigate through the folder structure on the environment on the main page. There's ways of creating new, new uh, notebooks. So there's a button that says new, which allows you to create new notebooks or create a terminal uh, or a new folder on your environment. So there's a variety of things you can do. Um, um, we'll go through the details of this next week. I'll send out an email to you guys. Um, um, scheduling a, a little session where we I'll demonstrate how to use the environment. The session will also be recorded, and then if you if you don't have time for that session, you'll have access to the recording uh, and can watch it offline. Um, so as uh, some of you already uh, were trying to find out, we will have a setup that has all the notebooks related to this SAR training. It's going to reside in the folder structure in notebooks. SAR training, English, and then you NAVCO in SAR. If you go there right now, this folder will not yet exist. That will come up over the weekend. Um, um, but while you are in this English folder, there are some other notebooks that you can play with. 
And so I encourage you to go in and just open some of these notebooks to get used to, you know, the concept of Jupyter Notebooks and, and, and how to use them, uh, um, uh, you know, while you're experimenting and exploring the environment. So this is what the setup will use up, uh, look like in the end. Uh, you'll have a bunch of different folders once you created everything. Um, and, and the notebooks uh, look like this. They have little book symbols on the side, and those are the ones that we'll be using for the training. And uh, yeah, so we can skip all of this, but you can look through sort of what notebooks are and why they're useful. I'm not going to go through that in detail. What I wanted to show you in the end is just some of the work you can do once you have all of this set up. Oops. Yeah. So you can, uh, this environment will allow you to, to create uh, data stacks there. You can create up to data stacks. This training will mostly focus on, on phase data stacks and then, you know, analyze these data stacks over time. Um, so next in the training, you'll learn about uh, INSAR time series analysis, but this is just a reminder that you also can utilize the SAR image information itself to understand dynamic processes that are too drastic for INSAR, uh, but are still relevant to track. So there's a variety of things you can do once once you are in the environment you are set up. Do you have any questions at this point? So you say uh, the, the folders will be there over the weekend sometime. So people should, they can they can peruse other full other notebooks. Uh, right. Are there any in particular that you would recommend yeah, that they stay around? Uh, actually, wanted to show this here real quick. Uh, yeah. So, can you see my screen still? Let me zoom yeah. in. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. We can. So this is what this will look like. You you won't have this folder has a note that's just one for me, but you will have currently you have a folder called hazards, a folder called ecosystems, and one called master. The master folder is really just for us uh, uh, an, a collection of notebooks that we're using in a variety of trainings. Um, so that's less interesting. But if you look into either the hazards or the ecosystems folder, you'll find a set of notebooks that you can run through. Um, let me sort those by name. Um, those were used uh, for, for online trainings that we did targeting very specific disciplines. Um, so feel free to uh, to open one of those and, and run through those. Um, there's a, a notebook on on uh, you know time series analysis using Gi using Giant, but there are also simpler notebooks like how do you create an RGB using from from either multipolarization or multi-temporal SAR data sets. Um, so there's a variety of things that you can you can play with. Each of these notebooks, you know, will look similarly in concept. They have text in them uh, that explains um, you know what the notebook is doing and then executable code that you can run um, and just run all just for fun um, so it exposes the python code that you can run and sort of while you go through the notebook you will actually create uh, output um, uh, that you can right away look at like here this is a data stack of about 80 80 time slots slots to do some amplitude time series analysis, and you can visualize these data sets. It will show you how to do that using, using Python, and it lets you, um, it's still processing, uh, it lets you create some, in this case, it shows you how to create RGBs from um, multi-temporal um, data sets. So this is what these notebooks look like. Uh, it shows you how to create animations if you wanted to just see what's going on. In an environment is actually quite interesting. This is in a rainforest, and all the variation you see that there's a lot of atmospheric effects actually in C band um, that you see in the amplitude data as clouds move through. It's quite interesting actually. And here are some RGB co composites that you can create from multi temporal data, and it shows you later on how you can create them from multi polarization data, for instance. So that's just not super related to the training, but feel free to peruse those and, and look at all of them and one or the other may be of interest to you um, uh, outside of what will be covered in, in the main SAR training. 
Yeah, it uh, it is very helpful to look through these. Uh, one way to actually learn how to create your own uh, workflow in a Jupyter Notebook is by looking at these examples and just tweaking the parameters. You can't really break anything, so to speak. Um, if you want to actually, Franz, if you make a modification to one of these notebooks in your area and you break it and then you want to go back to the original, what is the yeah. methodology for that? Right. So if, say if you have a notebook like this, this is a notebook that's perfectly working. Um, and But now you want to you know, start some bigger surgery on that notebook. Um, one approach to uh, make sure that you are you can always revert to the last working version of this notebook. You can, before you do a big surgery, you can go to File, and then Save and Checkpoint. What that does, it, it, creates, it creates a time checkpoint that's tracked. And uh, you can later on, when you make changes, you can go to Revert and you break it. You can go to Revert to an earlier checkpoint. That's one hmm. way how you can do it. Should you have forgotten, so should you use one of the, the pre-created pre notebooks and you want to change it and you broke it, another way of fixing it, you know, while I'm already in the weeds, yeah. is you can, um, so let's leave this notebook, um, say this is the notebook we changed, oops, this is the notebook we changed and we broke. So what, I, what you can do, the easiest thing to fix it is you click, you activate it, and you delete the notebook. And then you uh, um, go to control panel and you shut down your server. Every time you start the environment, it's going to check on GitHub for all of the notebooks that are on GitHub and it will check on your environment for all of the notebooks that are missing. And so in this case, I deleted the notebook. So it, it, it will find it on GitHub and will re-retrieve it. And you will have the pristine uh, notebook back, um, you know, the unbroken notebook back. If you change the notebook and you don't want to lose the content, no problem. When it merges the GitHub content with the content on your machine and it sees it will check whether your notebook was changed if it was changed it will not overwrite it so no worries they will you will not lose your work but if you end up either by accident or on purpose if you end up deleting a notebook um, um, it will be re-retrieved so you see now that this notebook is back and it's back to its original state um, and, and it, it will it will work again so this is one way of doing it. If it's a canned notebook and you broke it, delete the notebook, restart your server, and you'll get the original version back. 